Welcome to Mom and Mind, a podcast about maternal mental health from conception, pregnancy, to birth and postpartum. Real stories from moms and family members who've made it from struggling to wellness, and interviews with experts and advocates who work for moms and families to get the help they need. We discuss very real struggles that can sometimes be hard to hear, but these are stories that need to be told so that moms and families can know that healing is possible. This podcast is meant to offer information and awareness and is not a replacement for treatment by a professional or professional training. Thank you for being with us today. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Mom and Mind. I'm your host, Dr. Kat. Our summer here in Southern California is winding down and my kiddos are getting ready to go back to school. My seven-year-old will be entering second grade, which is very hard to believe. She's my daughter who experienced postpartum depression, anxiety, OCD, and postpartum rage with. And every time I look at her, I'm like, "How one, how did you get so big? And two, I'm so glad we made it through that time and were able to have a good and connected relationship, even though things were so difficult for me at that time. So that, you know, when kids go into their next grade, it's kind of this check-in you know, where things have been and how things are going. And it's always hard to believe how old your kids get. And she just feels like an old lady to me now at seven years old. My little guy, he's four in his last year of preschool before kindergarten. So we're moving right along over here. In other news, I'm really excited. We've had some interest in sponsorship and support for the podcast, and I'm really excited because that's going to help us grow and be able to get the message out to more and more people. So please be on the lookout for that coming up in the next couple of episodes. For today's episode, I'm talking with Christina Delaney, and she is sharing her experience with postpartum psychosis, some of the symptoms she experienced, and her healing process. And she's also gonna share with us that she's now helping other moms. And she's an advocate now. Christina now lives in East Tennessee with her husband and two children, now four and two. Her postpartum crisis occurred on May 22nd, 2015, when her youngest was five and a half months old, and they lived just outside of Greensboro at the time. She has made a full recovery and now advocates for perinatal mental health in her area. So let's hear from Christina. Welcome, Christina. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much for having me. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, I appreciate that you reached out and wanted to share your story and your experience. I think it's really necessary for people to understand all what went on with you and also how you're helping people now and that you've made it through and that you're feeling better now. So I'm excited to let people know that there's hope even when they feel so, so bad and also want to hear from your experience. So maybe you can just start there and let us know what happened from wherever you'd like to start. Okay. Basically, my journey with postpartum psychosis, which is what I was diagnosed with, began kind of automatically happened on a Friday afternoon when I was supposed to drive by myself with my two little girls who were two and five and a half months old at the time that it occurred, I was supposed to drive with them to the beach. It was Memorial Day weekend. My husband had had off that Friday because he was supposed to work that weekend. And that morning, my mind was just unorganized. It had all sorts of thoughts running through it. I called my boss and quit my job that morning. I called the pastor of our church at that time and went and visited, which is completely outside of my normal routine, Mm -hmm. made really abnormal phone calls that were outside of normal activity for me, was very hyper-religious. And my husband started to be concerned about things that I was saying, things that I was doing. I made a phone call to a good friend of mine and I made sense to her, but my ideas were very grandiose in nature, so she was concerned, but I don't think she had my husband's cell phone number, or she may have had my husband's cell phone number, but she didn't feel comfortable actually calling him, so I think she actually sent a Facebook message to him saying, Mm -hmm. "Um, this is not right, so he actually stepped out of 
are, and is that we actually lived in a townhouse at the time. And this was two years ago. We lived in a townhouse at the time. He stepped out to make a phone call. And at that moment, I thought Jesus was returning. So I grabbed up our girls and I just kept saying, please save us. Please save our family. Please save our friends. And my husband came back in the townhouse and I had our girls and he was like, what are you doing? And he said, my face was completely pale and I was very disorganized. And then I had passed out and the doctors were seeming to think that I was making myself pass out. I don't really know how, <laughs> but like on purpose um, or because of what you were experiencing? I don't really know, mm-hmm. but I fell to the floor. So he knew something, of course, was not right. So he called 911. And so, of course, when you call, we lived in a townhouse, so everybody came when you call. And oh. he didn't think it was medical at this point. He thought something psychiatric probably was going on, but he just didn't know what. So he called and made sure someone could watch our girls, called 911. The medics came, fire department came, the sheriff's department came. And when they came, I was telling them, I thought I was dying. I was Mm -hmm. telling them to pump on my chest, intubate me. And I'm a registered nurse. So I guess it's just my medical background coming out when I thought that I was going to die. Meanwhile, I'm talking to them. And in between times, I just lay back on the floor and act like I was passed out. And so they loaded me up in the ambulance and some friends of ours quickly came to take care of our children. And I guess I had thought that I was fine and ran out of the ambulance Mm -hmm. and went back into our living room. (laughs) And the friends of ours that were there to watch our children were like, what are you doing? I told them, I said, I'm fine. Y'all can go. You know, I'm fine. Mm-hmm. At that point, my husband was like, let's get back on the ambulance. You know, you are not okay. And thankfully, I went willingly and didn't have to be committed. You know, because once you're committed, it's public record. And it probably would have had to have been a lot more paperwork when I went back to work because I don't know what the nursing board would have had to have seen Mm -hmm. for me to go back to work. So I went willingly on the ambulance. My husband did have to ride with me in the back. Um, And of course, all our neighbors who were home came out because when you live in a townhouse, you you live in very close quarters. Right. So everyone who was home was out wondering what was going on. So they took me to the psychiatric ER of course, not the regular ER, but where they had psychiatric holding, I guess. Mm -hmm. And I stayed there for three nights. And that's where my memory starts to fail me because I don't remember much about anything. I just remember what my family tells me. If I can ask a question. So uh, what you've just told us about your experience, was that from your memory or was that stuff that people filled in for you? Or a mix of both. I do remember Mm -hmm. getting out of the ambulance and going back. I do Mm -hmm. remember all of that. I do remember telling them to innovate me and pump on my chest and thinking Mm -hmm. that I was. It was almost like an out of body experience looking down Mm -hmm. on myself at that point. Very odd. And I can totally see because it was very real. Mm hmm. My mind thinking some of these thoughts and some of these things were very, very vivid and very real. So none of your thoughts up until that point seemed strange to you? It it all seemed Absolutely. like actual real fact and things that had to be attended to? Very much so. Okay. Very much so. So when I see these news stories, and I mean, my heart goes mm-hmm. out to these women that experience these things because it's out of mind, out of body experience. Right. And they're very real thoughts. And then afterwards, it's very scary. It's very scary to think what can actually happen. Because then I'm told when I got into the ER, I was suicidal. And I've never been suicidal. I've never had a history of being suicidal, of being depressed, of being bipolar, Mm -hmm. none of those things. So it's a very scary thing 
to think that this psychosis can take over your mind. And from what you described before, it sounds like from your experience anyways, that you were fine one day and then just not, or was there something that led up to that? I think I experienced postpartum depression with my first Mm -hmm. and dealt with it myself. And I think I experienced postpartum anxiety and depression with the second and seek out help like I may should have. Now, I don't know if I did seek help, it would have changed anything. I'm not sure. No one will never know. But yes, I was pretty okay. To me, I was fine. To others, to my family, I was probably depressed and anxious. I should have gotten help. Yes. The week leading up to, I was overly compassionate, very on cloud nine, Mm -hmm. um, looking back. Okay. So some signs were there, Mm -hmm. but we didn't know. Right. And even going through nursing school, I had never heard of postpartum psychosis. And when I went to see my OBGYN after the fact and just getting him updated, he hadn't seen it in 10 years. Hmm. so rare and I told him I said I've never heard of postpartum psychosis he said well that's a heck of a way to find out about it I said yes (laughs) yeah so I spent two weeks three days in the ER and then I was only 45 minutes away from UNC's inpatient psychiatric facility Hmm. but unfortunately they didn't have any beds available Hmm. I was transferred to an inpatient general psychiatric unit where I spent two weeks there with a 24-7 sitter pretty much the entire time because I was suicidal. Um, So I wasn't allowed to leave the unit. I couldn't go downstairs to eat. I couldn't go outside. I was pretty much locked on that unit the entire time with someone next to me. Were you allowed to have visitors or see your children? I wasn't allowed to see my children. I could see visitors twice a day for about 30 minutes. But no children? No. Wow. Okay. Yeah. But in all honesty, I don't know that I would want my children to see me that way. Mm. But at the same time, I never lost sight of who they were. Right. And I never had ill thoughts towards them. Mm Mm-hmm. So I say, I don't know that I want them to see me that way. So I don't know. Right. Right. And maybe not in that environment that's not meant necessarily for children to come and visit. A general unit is very different than a specialized perinatal mental health unit. Absolutely. Yes. Wow. So So at what point in your process of, I guess, being at the hospital, did you start to feel like you were coming back to yourself or how would you describe it? That's a question I kind of get asked a lot because there wasn't a point where my memory just flipped on. It kind of just got gradually better every day. And it was just a process. And my family, they were there for me throughout the entire process. And they told me, they said, it's a process. You just have to yeah. Trust the process. It got very frustrating, I'm sure. very frustrating. In the hospital, I think throughout the end of it is where my memory got better. I still remember being very still outside of reality. Yeah. But I think they probably discharged me a bit early. Mm. But when I talked to my husband about it, he says that I wouldn't have gotten any better if I had stayed there any mm-hmm. longer. Mm. And I wanted to get home to my children so badly. So I was doing everything in my power to do that. And (laughs) being a nurse, knowing exactly how to answer that question every day towards the end to get out of there. I knew how to do it. But uh, when I got out, I had to go to an intensive outpatient therapy. Mm -hmm. Three hours of therapy every day, group therapy every day. Was that a specialized care for maternal mental health or a general IOP group? A general IOP. Okay. How did that go? I didn't like it. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I mean, I didn't participate very much probably because I didn't like it. Mm -hmm. And I tried my best to get out of it whenever I could. 
understood because since I was still outside of reality, I was mm-hmm. relating to people like they were older or younger versions of my friends or family. Mm-hmm. So it was like being in group therapy with my friends and family. Oh. It was very odd. Wow. It was very odd. Yeah. I think that's a particular experience for moms who are dealing with perinatal mood or anxiety disorders that go into, into general groups, no matter how you're doing, just maybe I should restate that, going into general groups with the range of experience that you might be having in postpartum, it's really hard to be connected and to feel supported by other people in a general group. Yes. And I had to hear about, you know, other people's medication experiences and, Mm -hmm. you know, what they were going through, no matter where they were in their journey. And Mm -hmm. here I am just getting out of a awful experience. I mean, because literally I thought I was in hell on earth in the psych ward and trying to wrap my brain around what had just happened to me. Was there Um, anybody on the psych ward unit on that unit who could explain what was going on or who tried to or who understood perinatal postpartum psychosis? I highly doubt it Mm -hmm. because even going to my therapist afterwards, I don't think they could hardly explain it to me. Mm -hmm. I've seen two different therapists afterwards, and I think my second therapist that I've seen, I was the one educating her about postpartum psychosis. So, I mean, it's such an undereducated disease process Mm -hmm. and understudied. Right. Absolutely. That probably not. And I don't remember, so I might not be saying specifically, but I highly doubt it. Mm -hmm. How did people treat you? Did they treat you differently because it was a postpartum psychosis? Or, I mean, can you even speak to that, how people treated you? I can't because I don't remember. Mm. I have requested my records, so hopefully I will be able to piece it together more soon. Because, I mean, my visitors, my family wasn't around enough to know how they treated me. Mm-hmm. Like, cause I've asked questions cause I got injections while I was there to calm me down. And I've asked questions, you know, why exactly was I given, what was I doing to mm-hmm. receive an injection? You know, it's just because maybe I was overly anxious or right. needed to calm down. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I guess I always lean towards feeling concerned about specifically about mothers with a postpartum psychosis experience that because like you were saying, people aren't trained, people don't understand it. Then I just worry so much about moms being treated poorly because other people don't get it. I mean, that is something that happens. Yeah. I don't remember being treated poorly. And I think My family would have known and probably picked up on it because they were very supportive. And my husband even said that going from the ER, having to ride in a van by myself from the ER to the general psych unit, one of the staff at the ER, one of the, I guess she was a CNA, actually volunteered willingly to ride with me so I would be more comfortable that's nice. Because he okay. didn't know he he didn't know he couldn't ride with me. Oh, well, yeah. So okay. And then so you spend two weeks in the hospital, and then what was the process for you after that for your continued healing and recovery? So I had to go to the intensive outpatient therapy every day for about two or three weeks, and I would have some off days because you know I requested it. Me and my husband will go and do things on our off days. And I had to go to therapy after that. I did everything that everybody wanted me to do. I took all my medications. They put me on an antipsychotic, antidepressant. So that wasn't anything that I was used to taking. And I had to be, I couldn't drive. I couldn't work. I couldn't watch the kids by myself. And I had to have someone watch me constantly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I had to have my own babysitter for a while. In your experience, did you feel like that was supportive for you, that you had to have somebody Um, with you all the time? At the time, not really. I mean, now I know that it was absolutely necessary. Mm -hmm. But at the time, there was a point that I had had enough. I felt like I was being tortured 
because, I mean, there was even times that my husband had to stand over me and watch me take my medications because they didn't think I was taking them. Mm -hmm. And I was because, I mean, I'm a nurse. Why can't I take my own medications? Yeah. Why does right. someone have to sit here and stand over me watching me take, take them? Right. So there was one day I'd had enough and we were driving around in my husband's truck and I tried to open the door and jump out. And that was probably the lowest point mm -hmm. I'd ever been. That's heartbreaking. And it was the only time, yeah, it was the only time that I ever remember being suicidal. Mm -hmm. In the whole process. But I, okay. Right. Yeah. I honestly felt like I was being tortured in so, every possible mm -hmm. way because I couldn't do anything by myself. How long was that incident from when you went to the ER? It was probably a week and a half after I was discharged. Okay. So, so close to a month. He, Mm -hmm. Close to a month. So, so it was within that window mm -hmm. of being on new medications. I mean, even then I did everything, you, mm -hmm. you know, you're supposed to do and they tell you to do. If you get suicidal, I went, you know, back to the psychiatric facility where I was the last place I'd ever want to go back to. Right. Because I hated it there. Mm -hmm. But I went because that's what they told me to do. And I got an evaluation they said I was fine to go home. And at that point, the shotgun was taken out of the house. The mm -hmm. knives were all hidden. I had to ask for a sharp knife if I ever needed it. Wow. So all safety measures were in place all the time. Yeah. And they were for the next, oh, year and a half, year or so, until we moved last January 2016. In terms of your... A recovery, and this may be hard to say, but how long do you feel like it took from, I guess, that time with, when you went to the ER from when you started to feel better? I would say probably at least eight months or a year. Mm, it's a long time. Yeah, I went back to work. See, it happened late May. I went back to work around, I think, July but it was just light duty desk mm -hmm. work only. I didn't go back to the bedside until probably early September, I think. Mm -hmm. So the, the process of recovery took a lot of energy itself, going oh, yeah. to appointments, get, making all the medication, all the safety plans are in place, Absolutely. having people sitting with you for as long as needed, I guess. Absolutely. Yeah. And well, I how, thought it. You fought it? Yeah, I did it. I did it, but I did not like taking the medications. Yeah. Or at least the antipsychotic. Every time I went back to the psychiatrist, I was like, when can I get off of this? When can I get off of it? Mm -hmm. But I just didn't, I didn't like it because I had worked very hard to lose 30 pounds after my second child mm -hmm. and it made me gain it all back. Oh. Plus them. oh man. So it was very frustrating, but you know, it's made me who I am, you know, postpartum psychosis is part of my journey now. Right. So along with the recovery, along with the medications I had to take, mm -hmm. along with the weight gain, you know, right. I'll lose it one day, maybe if I don't, you know, <laughs> it is what yeah. it is. Right. Yeah. So. And you're sharing your story pretty widely also um, in postpartum progress. You shared it there and other mm -hmm. places and really trying to get the message out there about postpartum psychosis. Yes, I think it's very important. Do you find that people are open to listen and open to learn? I do. So far, I haven't had any negative comments. Everyone so far in my network has been supportive of me and sharing my story. If they're not, they haven't mentioned anything mm -hmm. that they're not and that's fine if they're mm -hmm. not but you know I've heard nothing but positive things and nothing but a supportive nature and environment right. wherever I share my story right I mean I think it's so. so important too because you know there are a lot of people who don't understand postpartum psychosis and don't really so. get what happens to a mom who's experiencing this and by you sharing your story and your experience and all of the things that you've had to do to cope and recover and survive through this, um, 
you're helping them learn, you're helping reduce the stigma that, you know, you're not just some lady who's doing these crazy things or all these other labels that you hear. You're really bringing it down to earth and helping people understand that this happens to very real people. Absolutely. So you, as far as I understand now, you're doing work in this area to raise awareness for maternal I mental am. health and postpartum psychosis. Yeah. What are you up to? I Right now, I'm working with a couple of psychologists in the area to hopefully build a local coalition or task force here in Washington County, Tennessee, to help raise awareness and also help gather the resources that are really necessary in this area because there's not many resources here in this area for postpartum moms. And it's really important, not only for local moms, but I mean, I have two little girls that may need it one day, you Mm -hmm. know, because they're risk of having postpartum psychosis is higher since I experienced it. So I absolutely do want to help moms in this area, but I want resources to be in place for future moms and my children, whether they're in this area or not when they do have children. Right. But I mean, resources are definitely needed everywhere. Um, Oh yeah, absolutely. It's a lot of work what you're doing and absolutely necessary to, you know, kind of pound the pavement, so to speak, and uh, get people listening and get people understanding what this really is. And also that there's help, there is help available. And who knows what would have happened had you had access to like the Chapel Hill program. But we do know that having a specialized support helps more than not. Yes. Yeah. I'm just so curious always for people who have gone through postpartum psychosis or any perinatal mood and anxiety disorder, what got you through? What do you feel like was the thing or things that helped you to get through and to get to recovery? My faith is very important to me. So I had a lot of people praying for me. And without that, I'm not sure that I would have made it. And also my family. So my husband, my family and friends really were a huge help to me. Without them, I don't know what I would have done. Right. So you felt all of that support and I'm assuming then encouragement and help even with taking care of the children and absolutely all of the other stuff that needs to happen in order for you to get the help that you need. Yes. I mean, I had to have a babysitter afterwards. So Mm -hmm. someone had to watch the kids. Someone had to watch me. Mm -hmm. So it was very helpful. And my husband had a very supportive management team at work that Mm -hmm. allowed him to come visit me. I think he actually could come visit me at lunchtime too. I can't exactly remember, but he came before work, after work. If he needed off, they let him. They were very willing to work with whatever he needed. That's Um, great. So they were very helpful during that time. And actually the hospital where I was at was part of where he worked. So I was considered a very high security patient, Mm -hmm. which probably didn't help with my mental state at the time. Yeah. But it helped to know that I was being, you know, kind of taken care of. Mm -hmm. Sure. And that his management team cared Mm -hmm. and that they weren't gossiping and all that. But, you know, he had a great staff support around him Mm -hmm. because he needed that too. That's so true. Yes. And his family and my family really rallied around us during that time. And we, it's a, one of the times that we needed it most um, in our life. Right. So I'm so glad for you and your family that you were able to get through this and you got the help that you needed, maybe didn't want at times or didn't understand at times, but it was, enough to help get you through and keep you here and keep you safe. Yeah. For other moms. It could have been a very different outcome. (laughs) Oh, right. And from what you were saying, I mean, there were multiple times where it got that difficult, where things could have been very different. Absolutely. Yeah. So for other moms and families and whoever else is listening, what do you really want people to know about postpartum psychosis and or your experience specifically? I would want other women, you know, 
anyone to know that the experience of postpartum psychosis is a very different one and that women that experience it are not crazy. They're very normal women who have very real thoughts that are very real to them and it doesn't make them monsters. They may do different things, but the experience is very real to them at the time, but it doesn't make them any less human than anyone else. For women that are experiencing, you know, any of the perinatal mood or anxiety disorders, it's okay to reach out for help. That's one thing that I wasn't ever very good at doing. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm still getting better at doing it at times, but it's okay to ask for help. It's okay if you're comfortable, you know, reaching out to your obstetrician, OBGYN, telling them that things are not quite right Mm -hmm. and maybe you need some assistance, even if you don't know what it is um, to seek that help. Right. Great. Thank you for that. I really hope that those who are listening can take that in. I know that very specifically when sometimes when moms listen to these episodes, they do reach out for help afterwards because it's like, it's almost like permission in a way that to know that you're not crazy and that help is there and available. And I think you telling your story and sharing your experience is a key and a gateway for other women to get the help that they need and other providers to realize that they need more training and more experience to be able to support moms and women and families in the way that they deserve. So I thank you so much for sharing your experience and I'm so glad you're still with us. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me and I'm glad I'm here too. Thank you again, Christina, for coming on and sharing your experience with us and your healing process and how you're helping other moms now. You know, there are quite a few moms who deal with this and whose voices aren't heard. And so, you know, the importance of Christina and other moms who've had these experiences telling their story is is invaluable, really. It opens up a dialogue. It helps those moms who are listening to know that there's a place for them to get help and support. And there are people out here in the world who really understand and who are advocating for them. I just can't underscore enough how important telling our stories is. I'm really grateful to Christina for doing just that. If you'd like to get connected with Christina, she does have a Facebook page called Into the Light and Thriving. You can connect with her there, and I'll put all of that in the show notes, as well as a link to her article on postpartum progress. For those of you who are just joining us for this episode, I'm inviting you on over to the Mom and Mind Connection Facebook group where we're growing and where we're growing to make connections around the topics of this podcast, have discussions, get support, make connections about resources and any other thing that comes up that's related to the Mom and Mind podcast and perinatal mental health. Please come on over and join us and join in the discussion over there. And I will also direct you to www.momandmind.com where you can find this episode and all of the rest of our episodes as well as links to the many platforms that the podcast is on. If you haven't yet been over to iTunes to subscribe to the Mom and Mind podcast, head on over there, click subscribe, and then you'll get all of the episodes automatically downloaded for you to be able to pick and choose from. All right, everybody, until next time. By joining us today, you are part of the growing community of people who are aware and concerned for mothers and families during this beautiful and sometimes very difficult time of life. If you or someone you know is having a hard time, help is available. You can feel better. Please look for resources for help at momandmind.com. Together, we can support moms and families so that no one has to deal with this alone. Thank you for listening and being a part of the Mom and Mind community.